very warm welcome to everybody. Um, we see we're the last panel tonight. Uh, we already had an introduction to the panel given by Manuel right now. So uh, the topic that we have is CPU vulnerabilities, how to resist the future techs, uh, new technologies, and the future trends in IT security. And for this, we have some out outspoken experts with us. Uh, two of the outspoken experts are from Austria, from Austrian companies, and uh, one expert that we have with us is Romanian, here in a Romanian com company, which is a subsidiary of an Austrian company as well. Well, let me start up with Harald Reisinger. Harald Reising is the Managing Director, Service Management and Innovation of Radar Services. Harald Reisinger has over 20 years of experience in corporate management in the IT sector. He's the co-founder of Green Tube Limited, and before and during the IPO phase of BetandWin.com, better known that uh, BWIN party nowadays, um, he was the member of their management team. In 2001, Harald Reisinger founded Basecamp, uh, developing into one of Austria's largest IT security companies, and uh, then started off with Radar Services. It actually originated, Radar Services, the company that you own right now and run right now, together with your co-founders. It originated from his idea for an IT risk management as a managed service. So he has a completely different approach with Radar Services into how to address the IT security issues in companies, in their clients. Harald Reisinger studied international business, interesting enough, you now you're in a very technical topic, but you studied international business at the Vienna University of Economics and Business and at the University of Nebraska in Omaha, uh, I guess the city better known for Warren Buffett living there and being there. <laughs> Radar Services is Europe's leading technology company right now in the field of IT security detection and response. Um, in focus is the early detection of IT security risks for corporations and public authorities and is offered as a solution or as a managed service. It's a completely different approach. Manuel Wiesinger, our second panelist, was already with us, already held a speech, got a bit technical. This is when I got a bit scared when he got technical. Um, but Manuel is a security researcher at SPA Research and uh, started as a free software fanatic and a security researcher at SPA Research. At the age of 15, you started using Linux <laughs> and worked, with, uh, worked at, uh, as a sysadmin. You ducked into the NetBSD kernel yeah. Actually, also wear the free BSD shirt from the Stockholm Convention in 2015. Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> and uh, you worked on the free BSD projects as well. You wrote your master thesis on the Linux kernel security and developed a fascination for side channel attacks and software diversity. When not researching, you're involved in the Vienna hacking community. Mm -hmm. Whether that is good or bad, we might discuss it later on, but we hope it's only good. <laughs> SBA Research is a research center for information uh, security funded partly by the National Initiative for Comet, which is the competence center for excellent technologies. And within a network of more than 70 companies, 15 Austrian universities and institutions, also international in, in universities, and many additional international research partners, uh, they all jointly work on the research challenges ranging from organizational to technical security to strengthen Europe's cybersecurity capabilities. And last but not least, not least, we have with us Tamas Bakos. Tamas Bakos is a software developer at Catalyst Romania. He's a software developer and a software and security enthusiast, and uh, is based in Cluj Napoca, where the Romanian subsidiary of Catalyst is. His field of expertise is reverse engineering, actually. Catalyst employs right now over 300 passionate people since uh, its creation in 2005 and they create products and uh, projects in 12 locations all over Europe. One of those locations being here in Romania, in Cluj Napoca. Um, they are taking up the challenges to come up with solutions for services for the clients, like custom software development, project work, product development, from small to large, anything it is, from the way to technical consulting, also all the way to infrastructure. So I would actually like to ask uh, Manuel, to take us on the journey, to start off with a bit of an explanation, what are we talking about in this topic? You had a nice presentation before. We're going to have the presentation shorter and less technical right now, so I can actually also follow you. And I would love to, uh, if you could start up with your presentation. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Thank you. So I'm just going to uh, give a uh, short overview about uh, CPU vulnerabilities and where are we now with them. So uh, remember the very first day of January in 2018, many people or many people were aware of uh, Meltdown on Spectre vulnerabilities discovered in mid-27 by, by Google and publicly available by, uh, by the 2nd January or 1st January 2018. 
And uh, for, for me, this was a huge shock because I was like, uh, oh my God, do I have to throw all my data away? Do I have to throw all my computers away? Do I have to throw all my uh, CPUs uh, away? What, what can we do? We did not have proper uh, mitigations by then. And too bad the first reports about experimental uh, use of these vulnerabilities in malware occurred in February 2018. So still very scary. And then the rest of, two, of 2018, some other exploits were became public. So, uh, and right before, before coming here to Bucharest, there was yet another vulnerability discovered. So I really think that's not, that won't be the end. So what is the impact of these vulnerabilities? Basically, they allow local attackers to extract arb arbitrary data from local, uh, from local memory. So you have to have, so attackers have to have uh, code access or the possibility to execute code on the local machine. But this is also exploitable from JavaScript. There are proof of concept implementations for this which is uh, really bad because uh, buying some ad uh, online advertising which includes and executes JavaScript is not that hard. So attackers can easily uh, inject JavaScript code into a large number of websites and web browsers. So it's also kind of rem uh, remotely exploitable via this way. But even worse, uh, some specter attacks are also possible via the network. That really means you can in, uh, extract data via the network remotely. It's really slow, it's, uh, but it still works. It would be enough to extract keys via the network. And I was like, oh my God, do we have to throw it away? I want to throw all my CPUs away and went to the basement and found that old uh, 486. I have it here in my pocket. I showed it in uh, my presentation and I really want, felt like, oh my God, I have to use it. It has, uh, it has 16 megahertz That's, that, that should be suitable to run, to run my Emacs. But yeah, um, so who can feel safe? Because it's hardware vulnerabilities, literally no one using any operating system and because it's, the vulnerabilities are in, in the way CPUs work. It's also not uh, really dependent on the, uh, on the manufacturer because uh, any modern CPU speculatively executes uh, instructions, which is uh, the main, which is the main uh, cause for these vulnerabilities. So the, the only proper thing we can do is to never trust the memory. Don't trust what you put in memory and get rid of all the secrets as soon as it's possible for you. So how can we fix CPU vulnerabilities by software? I'm, I'm really confident because a motivating example is um, the Hubble telescope. When, we, when the Hubble telescope was shot to space in the mid 90s, they installed a wrong mirror. So all the results were uh, completely bar garbage and useless. So uh, really, really bad. A few hundred millions blown away. But uh, however, the error is constant and predictable. So the NASA was able to, uh, to, to write software that actually fixes these hardware bugs. So I'm really confident that hardware bugs can be fixed by software. And Everybody who got the heads up now because of the, the critical network art, uh, attacks and uh, remote exploitability of such um, attacks, uh, there are some limitations, luckily. They are still very difficult to do, requires a huge amount of work, and usually conventional attacks against the small business are, are easier to find. And the attacks via the network currently only work under laboratory uh, conditions. However, we don't know if, it's, uh, if somebody is exploiting this because a real reliable internet connection could, or, um, it could be exploitable or exploitable in another way we don't really know. 
but luckily they're really, really slow. You can extract via the network around uh, 15 bits uh, of memory per hour, but if you make it cleverly, that's still good enough to extract an AS key, for example, in, in about 17 hours. So, and luckily there are uh, many mitigations on the way. So mitigations against uh, are play typically pay based in the operating systems, in the CPUs, microcode, so in the so uh, in the firmware, uh, and some even in the compiler. But many of them introduce uh, performance penalties, which might be a significant impact for for small business because 30 30 per percent less execution speed is definitely something to to consider. Because in other words, that costs money. Yeah, there is a short uh, a short overview about all the vulnerabilities. Even in my talk, I did not address any of them. That would just take more than the one and a half hours we have here for our panel discussion. But it's just to show uh, fixes are, are on the way. But still, we can't know and we do not know what else is we must expect. As long as somebody cr crafted a CPU and the that is running and operating, somebody will craft a way to extract data from it. So I think that's, uh, that was it already, my introduction. Wonderful. Thank you, Manuel. Thanks very much for the introduction. Um, you actually... Thank you. You actually showed us now all the threats. Um, well, I would call it bad news. In journalism, one said bad news is good news. Um, transfer it to radar services. Uh, bad news is good news. Actually, for you, you've got to be happy about it. So we asked Harald to give us an introductory statement about radar services and the threats as well, and CPU vulnerabilities. Harald, may I ask you to start off? Yeah, of course. Um, hey there. Um, well, Manuel, thank you for the deep dive into the rabbit hole. I'm not taking you into the rabbit hole. I'm basically taking you out again a little bit. Uh, I would like to talk about uh, the situation regarding vulnerabilities in general. Uh, at the end of the day, we can say, say we are in a kind of an age of vulnerabilities right now. If you take a closer look at the distribution and all the vulnerabilities that have been found over the years, uh, probably over the last five years, there was a dramatic increase uh, oh, generally regarding vulnerabilities that have been published. Uh, think about uh, 2016, there were about 6,000 and something vulnerabilities being published. You know, anything between uh, low severity and high severity or critical. In 2017, we jumped to around uh, 14,700 vulnerabilities. Among those 14,700 vulnerabilities um, identified and published with CV numbers, in 2017, there were approximately 470 which had the highest criticality, a CV SS score of 10, which is really bad. Um, some of these, or most of these, actually remotely ex exploitable. Uh, we had around 1,500 of these 14,000 were uh, severity between 8 and 10, so very high severity with a very large number. The interesting thing was the, the jump between 2016 with the roughly 6,000 and 2017 with the roughly 14,000 uh, vulnerabilities being published. Nobody really can explain the jump, but it was dramatic over the time. In 2018, what do you think? What is the number now in November, as of November, uh, the total number of vulnerabilities without Googling it? Any idea what it could be? At least 6,000, yeah, good guess. So we are at uh, 14,000 approximately, uh, end of November, or end of October, sorry, end of October, of course. Uh, so this is uh, within 10 months. We more or less have, to have the same number uh, as in 2017 within 12 months. Um, does anybody think this will stop? Yeah, it's great for us, you know, for you guys, you're in the security, and it's great for us, for Radar, we are in security also. Of course, it will not stop. Uh, it will hopefully not increase too dramatically, but it will not go away. This will stay. So the question we have to ask ourselves, why is it so? Why do we have so many vulnerabilities out there? Um, who, who of you uh, guys and girls are working in the uh, security area of like uh, penetration testing and auditing? Not that many actually, okay. 
Um, but of course, you are somehow deep into the security area. So everybody likes vulnerabilities if you're a pen tester or in the security area. Um, we do like them because we can help people identify those vulnerabilities and basically make it better, mitigate or remediate the stuff. Nevertheless, it's all about why are there so many vulnerabilities. Um, it's both. It's software, of course, uh, and it's hardware, as we've heard um, right now. Interestingly, uh, hardware things uh, get more and more uh, exposed regarding vulnerabilities also. So we do have a severe problem in software design and software management when we create software, because that's why we have so many, or the majority of the vulnerabilities out there. We seem to have a hardware design issue also. Uh, so those are the mo powerful, most powerful drivers over the years. Now think of, and I think uh, half of Def Camp is full of IoT devices here, and how you can ex hack them or ex uh, expose the vulnerabilities. Think of all the devices that will come to the market that are already there, that are you know, quickly designed, that includes bad design sometimes. So this is going to you know, tremendously increase the number of vulnerabilities we're going to see over time. And uh, think of all the devices out there, those IoT devices and the IT systems that are connected. They will interact and they will be you know, on the internet or on open networks, so easily exposable. Uh, that's a problem, a real severe problem we're running into. So we have the software that is a problem, and we have the hardware that is more or less uh, getting a problem. And then we still have the why. Uh, so think of like Spectre and all the CPU vulnerabilities, or think of Heartfleet. So, <coughs> Who has actually an interest or might have an interest uh, in a very widespread vulnerability which is very hard to find but could easily give access to lots of IT systems out there uh, on the market um, without anybody knowing about it? So think of nation states. Uh, and if you think of nation state, the possibilities that go together with Spectre and everything and Heartbleed and all the uh, vulnerabilities that have been disclosed over the years. There might, I say no, not its reality, but there might be a long-term strategy and long-term interest by nation states because it's just a perfect way to interact with IT systems without anybody noticing it. And you can do with this system whatever you want. So in future, we have to think about how can we make it better? Uh, I think it's all about resilience at the end of the day. How can we make our IT systems, and those are everywhere, how can we make those uh, IT systems more resilient? So when we reduce it uh, to the attack vectors again, it's all about build better software. Uh, and that comes with have processes in place that support building better software. Uh, all the testings and everything, it's out there. So the, the concepts and everything is out there. Uh, but of course, and unfortunately, it's easier and faster to build software that is you know, uh, with, done within a couple of days instead of a couple of weeks probably because you have to test and test it again and test it again until you come to the conclusion that this is something you really can run. So we have to build better software. We have to invest in training and the processes and we have to allow the time, the, all the developers out there, the time to really do the testing and everything thoroughly. Second thing is of course we have to think about hardware designs. This is probably the, the hardest thing to fix uh, because hardware is typically not built for a year or two years but it stays there for a long time uh, so again, it's about designing uh, that stuff. The third thing when we think about resilience, because the vulnerabilities are there and they will not go away tomorrow, so we have to think about how can we detect it continuously. And detecting a vulnerability is you know, kind of easy, it can be done easily, uh, so we have to think about how can we thoroughly uh, combine the status of IT systems and the pot potentially uh, vulnerable uh, aspects of these IT systems with the behavior of these IT systems. And when we as Radar think about creating something like a, a real-time risk landscape of our client base, we have to consider both the status, that means the vulnerabilities of all the systems and the configuration problems they might have, that is basically the open door that is there, and the behavior of these IT systems. So if somebody walks through the door and does something bad with the IT systems, we have to consider both. So that's all about detection. Uh, Besides building better software that is more stable and has less vulnerabilities and designing better hardware, we thoroughly have to think about how can we detect the things that are going on that we don't want to have in our IT structures. Uh, yeah, that's the third part. Uh, and the fourth part, and that comes with everything basically, we have to sh make sure that the people who are building the software and using the software are well and thoroughly, thoroughly educated. So, 
it's you kind of patch something that's between the chair and the table and the, uh, the keyboard. So we have to train the people. Uh, and that's uh, hard to understand for somebody who really, you know, is in, in depth in security like you are. Uh, but for somebody who's just a user, it's quite hard to grasp the, you know, the potential and the threat they can create there. So we have to take the people with us on the journey to make it better and to not run into every single knife that is out there that could be a problem. So that was not detailed aspects of vulnerabilities, more high level aspects, but something we have to take care of on a high level, uh, more strategic uh, aspects we have to take care and consider. But I think it was okay for the introduction. Good, wonderful, back. wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, very interesting startup, actually putting up some topics that we're going to discuss here now in the next hour. Um, very interesting, so to say, like what happens, where it comes from, who might, uh, might it be by intention that uh, those, those vulnerabilities are there. But we discussed something else before, which I would be interested in right now. You said on the 2nd of January, uh, it was first time discovered Spectra. And uh, so this was the start of the discussion. Was it actually the first time that it was discovered there, or who discovered actually Spectra? Uh, well, two, two people independently. Uh, in in mid-27, uh, Google Project Zero, that's the uh, back that's the, the the security researchers at Google learned about these vulnerabilities and talked to to, to Intel, and independently people from uh, from Theo Graz in Austria learned uh, and discovered these vulnerabilities and reported them to Intel, and uh, the I, I spoke to them personally and the. Uh, uh, comment of Intel was uh, yes, we we already know. Uh, maybe we should do a phone conference with with Google and uh, Intel engineers. So it, they were really just discovered in just to the best of my knowledge in mid 2017. So it was the Technical University of Graz that you mentioned? Um, yes. So it was found out in Austria. It was found out by by Google. Um, why did one not react in between? Uh, you said we had six months that we already knew that vulnerabilities were there. Why did one not react on it before? Uh, well, Google reacted and they deployed uh, defenses in, in their own cloud infrastructure and uh, Intel uh, started to, to develop mitigation techniques. But until it was not uh, publicly available the, uh, and uh, no proof of concept exploit, uh, they, they just waited. And then the, the people from, from Graz, the researchers from Graz, they are being an independent uh, research facility in, at the university. Of course, they, they wanted to publish that because that's their uh, research reputation. Are they members of your association of SBA research? Uh, yes. Yep. So why do they do it? Uh, what do you do as an SBA research? What is actually the task that you have, the main task? Well, reading through a lot of research papers, uh, testing, testing the codes, trying to, to understand uh, the, the, the code, work, uh, work through proof of concepts, uh, try real exploits, and of course to, to look for attack vectors for new vulnerabilities and make a, make a scientific uh, paper out of it. Yeah. That's, that's my task there. Alrighty, so how much in, in reverse engineering? We heard that Tamas is an expert in reverse engineering. Um, how much can reverse engineering help you and assist you in finding such vulnerabilities? <clears throat> Sorry, so um, after Google and um, uh, and TU Graz found these vulnerabilities, it's well, really well known um, uh, how, the, how these vulnerabilities can be exploited. So reverse engineers can look for uh, code behavior that does the described um, attack. But, uh, well, how Google found out about this, how, how the reverse engineers at Google found out about this, uh, well, only they know they're geniuses or... Um, um, reverse engineers might also have a role in um, detecting uh, such attacks. Uh, for example, what uh, antivirus software does usually is uh, they generate signatures for uh, code patterns and then they match it to running code and you could do this to to these uh, well these attacks as well all right before starting off and going deep into the topic I would like actually Harold um, would like to ask you one more time what is the kind of service that you do, what differentiates, differentiates you from your competitors on the market? Why are you such a fast-growing company? Um, 
Okay, so what we're doing is we are kind of cyber defense center for our clients. So we are uh, analyzing uh, data, behavior data and status information, that means vulnerabilities and uh, configuration issues and all the behavior um, information based on network traffic and log data that is being collected and analyzed. And we convert that into something like a false positive free risk landscape. So telling the, the customer exactly what uh, incident security issues they do have in their environments, wherever that might be, and we give it a criticality, we give it an explanation what the customer needs to do, and it, we wrap it into a process. So we don't only throw the incidents over the fence and hope the customer is taken care of. We basically guide the customer through the process of every single incident, what to do with it. And after they have done it, they have solved the problem, we afterwards do the verification if they really have done it, or just told us that they have done it, basically. So, and this is a continuous service, a continuous process. Uh, to do so, we run the largest cyber defense center in Europe uh, with around 60 analysts um, that are continuously analyzing the data, really digging into the data. Uh, you know, you can, you can imagine billions of, of lines of data that we have to analyze uh, continuously for every single client. Uh, but it is imperative to do so. You cannot do it in another way, simply speaking. Uh, because um, when you take a large organizations, they have tens of thousands of IT systems, they create lots of amount of data continuously, uh, and you have to consider everything, basically, because you cannot blind out something. There, there, it's not a, like, a good idea nowadays to have blind spots in security analytics, because things are interconnected. Uh, if you focus just on the, on the core systems, uh, those are interconnected with other systems, which you, if you don't have them in focus, somebody might, or um, you know, an attacker or a malware might rush into these systems and take over the rest and you don't get it, basically. So yeah. you have to do everything at the same time, uh, which is complex and which is challenging, but which is nowadays the only way to go forward, actually. So um, you... Why we are successful and growing so fast, I think it's the comprehensiveness of what we're doing not blinding out uh, some things which are inconvenient, but really try to get as much information as possible. A uh, com combination of behavior, data, and, uh, and status information, and all the technology in the background you need, like the machine learning components, uh, and everything to you know, do the pre-analysis, and afterwards the manual analysis, really hunting data, following streams, until you come to the conclusion, this is an issue you have to follow up. Uh, and I think this really differentiates us on the market and uh, basically describes uh, why we are so successful. Are, are you telling us on the one hand side that the customer is actually not interested in IT security, the customer is not interested in the threat itself? Um, do you tell us that he's maybe not interested in solving the, the problems, just handing over the problems to you? Uh, what is your feeling that you get from the customers? I mean, the threats are getting more and more. Are the companies out there prepared for it? Well, it depends on who you talk to uh, in the customer's organizations. So, of course, the, uh, the security teams, the CISOs and those teams are, of course, interested because it's their job to make it transparent which IT risks the customers do have. Um, when you talk to the C-level, the CEOs and the COOs and the CFOs of the organizations, they more and more get you know, aware that, they, that it's their problem at the end of the day because if they don't, don't give a shit, sorry, uh, to, for, for this stuff. And if something happens, at the end of the day, it always comes back to the board. So they have to take responsibility. Uh, it gets harder when you talk to, to the IT operations teams because uh, when you identify something, let's say you have, I don't know, thousands of servers and you identify uh, five vulnerabilities on every server, which is a small number for typically uh, something to identify, you suddenly have, have between five and 50,000 uh, security issues you have to take care of. And it is guaranteed almost always that there are a thousand explanations why things cannot be dealt with right now. So it's always kind of convincing IT teams that it's necessary, imperative, to take care of these issues that are there. So that's why something like what we're doing is a continuous um, service you have to have, you have to be persistent, you have to go there, you have to convince them that it, they have to do it and it's doable. And otherwise, there is no second option at the end of the day. Yeah. But it only arrived on the sea level in the last year, as we understand. I mean, of we had course, a discussion yeah, like that yet last year. Only because it, all, it also means you have to spend money because this is, you either have to buy the technology and run it on your own, uh, which is more and more challenging because those systems are complex and you need time and people and know-how, uh, or you have to spend money for a service like we are offering. Uh, and, uh, but it's getting easier because the board is aware that they have to do something. Uh, it's just a matter of how fast are they doing it and what is the strategy. So it's either 
buy the technology, run it on your own, um, which is harder and harder, I think, or find somebody who can do it for you, uh, and you can split tasks. And our job is always the detection and the, uh, the creating the transparency, and the customer's job is always to solve the issues we have identified and described how yeah. to solve it. All right. I mean, we heard that uh, it was already known half a year before, um, but also when it was uh, when when it was disclosed that Spectre is uh, so to say a problem out there, uh, the disclosure was quite controversial. You said, Tamash. Um, why was it that controversial? The disclosure. What happened there? All right. So uh, let me give you some background about this as well. After um, Google and Google Project Zero and uh, the Technical University of Graz discovered this and notified Intel. Um, they also talked with a couple of um, manufacturers and uh, um, companies providing services that are affected, like, like Microsoft, Amazon, and so on. And uh, they agreed to keep the vulnerability under embargo, which means that we, they will not disclose it for a while. And this means that they will, well, the idea is not to give attackers opportunity to develop uh, the exploits. Um, but give the companies a chance to patch the vulnerabilities before. And, um, well, manufacturers being notified, there were also some Chinese uh, CPU manufacturers or um, device manufacturers that were notified uh, half a year before the public dis disclosure. And um, there were some controversy about these manufacturers that they might be working together with the Chinese government to uh, create devices with spyware installed on them for um, yeah, Chinese spying on the whole world. And so when everything was disclosed, the US uh, Cyber Emergency de Department was really not happy that the Chinese got uh, notified before them. Yeah. How does... Sorry, may I briefly... Oh, of course, I think this, the disclosure of vulnerability is always a big issue. Uh, I had a talk last year with uh, one of the member of the of the NSA team uh, and there is there is a board uh, a very secret board in the US which discusses newly identified vulnerabilities continuously and they make a case to case decision whether something is disclosed or whether it is so important for the national security agency for example or the CIA that they don't disclose that uh, information of vulnerability because they want to use it in future for you know their work basically they do this on a, uh, they meet, I think, uh, on a quarterly basis or if required uh, uh, with short notice, but they make these decisions. And you can, I can guarantee you they have, you know, the best information they can get from commercial sources and buying stuff and everything. So this is interesting, I think, because they continuously make the decision whether something like, like Spectre or, or Heartbleed are they going to um, disclose it so everybody can, everybody can take care of or as a nation state, utilize it for their you know, work they have to do on a daily basis. Yeah. Manuel, if we, if we hear that uh, they're not disclosing, they don't want to give the attackers the chance to, to develop the code, is it actually that easy? How does it work properly? How does the, the attack work? Is it that easy? You talked about the bytes and the bits and the bytes that you actually get out, uh, very low level. Is it easy? Is it something that you can really exploit? Uh, I would say, yeah, definitely. Once you have local code execution, uh, including JavaScript, then it's uh, definitely possible. So this is, this is really a, a real-world threat. But um, when I hear about agencies uh, finding vulnerabilities and not this disclosing there, then, then actually this is, something, this is something really motivating for, uh, for me as a junior researcher because uh, it, it just means, uh, well, there are things uh, we can discover that, that they already know. And, this, and we, get, uh, we get the credit and we can inform the public. So this is, in, in, my, per in my personal opinion, a very strong uh, argument for independent academic research for vul security vulnerabilities. Yeah. Because mean, there are a real f threat, you can never know if there is uh, real-world exploitation and, and who is, is using it. Has there been a real-world exploitation, like you're talking about attacks? Has any kind of malware already been uh, based on, on CPU vulnerabilities? Uh, there are the reports uh, from, from February 2018 where uh, uh, from, I think, Kaspersky or some, or some, some, and some larger uh, cybersecurity company about uh, experimental exploitation of these vulnerabilities, but I'm not aware of a large-scale uh, 
real world exploit. And I'm, I'm really convinced that the only reason why this is uh, not done is because there are easier and uh, therefore cheaper ways to uh, to get that, uh, the data you, you, you want or to access the data in an average company. All right. Tamas, you wanted to top up? Yes, uh, if I might add something. So uh, these vulnerabilities are currently not exploited uh, for malicious purposes. But we don't uh, know. But we don't know. I, I mean, as far as we know, sorry. So we cannot know if someone already read all of our data based on, our, on uh, these exploits because uh, they're really hard to detect. There are some um, methods. One of them is the signature base that I mentioned earlier. Um, but yeah, these issues are really low level and, and hard to notice. And um, yeah, and typically you can uh, craft, uh, once you have an attack worker, you can craft stealth attacks. So that take a very, very long time. It doesn't matter because the server is running uh, all the time anyway. And so in a couple of days, you very, very, very slowly extract data and extract data. And this makes it far more complicated for detection mechanisms, of course, because there are just tiny, very tiny stuff that, that sysadmins might not be aware of, and that might be very complicated for uh, detection software. So you say there might already be something else out there. Um, do you think you can anticipate some of the, of the codes of the attacks that are going to be out there? Do you think you, can, you know which way it's going to develop? That's uh, very different. That's very different. Uh, difficult to say because attacks work so differently on a on a technical level. But as long as you uh, get have stuff like speculative execution, where one or hyperthreading, where one process can really um, run very uh, physically very close to to another process, there might there will always be a way to to extract the data. So. Uh, and to answer your question, it, 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 re it really depends, but uh, as long as something is not completely isolated, there, there might be a way. We must always be aware of that. Yeah. I mean, let's say that what, what Harald said before might fire up a conspiracy theory um, that one talks about. Do you think that's possible or is it just simply not possible to create secure hardware? Well, uh, se secure hardware which is not connected to the internet in a com uh, in uh, and 10 kilometers under the sea without side channel capabilities might be secure, but it's, it's, it's really, really tough because you always have some side effects that you can observe. There might be, uh, might be even acoustic signals uh, which are not able, not really easy to shield or some side effects. So really guaranteed security is, uh, I would say, technically impossible because you have always some some side channels and, and where you can craft uh, or side effects, actually. In uh, the last uh, IT security panel that I had and the discussion that we had, uh, the talks about IoT, especially mm -hmm. the devices, uh, was a difficult one because they said the devices themselves, security is not part of the design of the device. Yeah. The device is only designed to function, yes. not to be secure. Um, so are any devices or all the devices, are they vulnerable to such uh, attacks? Yeah, as long as they execute uh, code at a, using, physic, using physical, uh, uh, physical uh, code execution, so processes, uh, I would say yes, there, there is definitely something to expect because uh, all, these, um, all these electrical devices work uh, by using uh, current, by uh, using uh, power and electricity and therefore their execution and operation has some side effects. Yeah. Um, if we talk about, uh, you know, now we talked about the devices, the devices are being used anywhere. Um, are there, Harald, are there any kind of sectors out there which are more prone to attacks than other sectors? Are there kind of sectors that are also more interesting for attack attackers? Well, more or less everybody uses the same hardware, software components underneath. So I think there is no difference in the industry regarding the, um, the how easy or how, how hard it is to attack. Uh, I think the uh, the effects of such attack are different, of course, varying from different industries. I mean, take um, a closer look at the critical infrastructure, like you know, all the electricity companies and everything. Uh, of course, uh, if you have an attack there and you take out, I don't know, uh, the uh, electricity steering system underneath, <clears throat> it just wraps hundreds of thousands of households without uh, power. Uh, the same is true for, of course, healthcare and everything. So. 
the simple answer is everybody's affected. Uh, the, the results uh, are different. Um, so you have to probably invest more time and more money for different industries. Uh, those are the critical in industries typically. Or if you have, you know, uh, trade secrets you want to keep and you have a specific market you're pretty good into, you probably have to invest more money to make it safer. Uh, but there are no secure systems, basically. So you have to make sure to do everything, uh, you know, technology-wise and regarding processes around to make it as good as possible. That's the main main issue, basically. Um, so the, the, the question of whether you have, you know, 95% uh, assurance or 98%, that's probably a very expensive 3% you can have achieved. But depending on the industry you're in, Yep. And uh, the money you make, you probably have to invest that uh, additional 3% anyway. Let's maybe ask the question a bit around. Do you see any industries which are you know, more willing to invest money into IT security than other industries? Oh, yeah, of course. I mean, the, all the banking and financing industry was, uh, I would say, by design, it's in their genes more or less that they have to invest money. You know, in early days it was the robbery. Nowadays it's the cyber robbery somehow. Uh, so the, the, it's in their genes that they, ha they have to invest money and they do it and they do it for a long time now uh, and they have, uh, you know, probably all the technology you can get for money. Uh, they have uh, well set processes, they are being audited regularly uh, by the authorities. So th th those are the guys who are really doing this for a long time and you see it when you go there, typically. Uh, and everybody else I think is trying to cope with the situation to make it as good as possible. Um, and the problem nowadays is not the money out there, because they all have money. All the organizations, they typically have the money to spend to buy technology. It's the people they are lacking, because there are, you know, there is not an unlimited source of experts out there who can run the systems, who can, uh, you can read the data, you can make the conclusions the right and take the right action. That's the issue we are running into. And that's why it's so important that uh, you are here, basically, you know, dealing with security and taking care of that, that you're really going into depth and are the experts out there and you probably do see it on the market. You, you can probably, every one of you get, get, can get 10 jobs tomorrow if you want uh, in any country you can think of. Um, so this is a very specialized uh, skill I think that is important now and will be much more important in the future. Yep. And that's the resources that is lacking actually. So if we talk about, you know, there's a high demand of IT security experts. Um, how big is the impact right now of machine learning or artificial intelligence in detection and analysis of IT securities? Well, if you go around in trade shows which are IT security focused, you can, you know, every second booth is talking about uh, AI uh, or machine learning. Um, I think the truth is it's, it's, it's a supporting technology that is super important and that will be more and more important in the future. The problem nowadays is, uh, you know, the promise they make you when, you when you buy machine learning technology is that you get less results which are more precise. The truth is the opposite, the exact opposite. You get more results uh, which are probably right uh, and you still have to invest time, you know, human brain and everything and experience to come to the conclusion if this is okay or not okay. So it, it's perfect supporting technology you need to have because you're talking about, you know, billions and billions of data sets you have to analyze. And it's impossible to, to grasp everything <coughs> manually. So you need to have machine learning. Uh, nowadays, there is no way. You have to have machine learning in place uh, that uh, is supporting you. But at the end of the day, I strongly believe within the upcoming 15 to 20 years, you still need the experts at the end of the day to draw the right conclusion and to say this is right and this is left. And this is important is not important. So, uh, Manuel, will we also need the experts in drafting up all the code? I mean, we talked about DDoS attacks before, and we said that DDoS attacks nowadays, you can download the code already from the Internet, you can start it. You don't have to be actually a geek or a nerd anymore. You also, me would be able to, to start off such a or to carry out such an attack. Yeah, you, just, um, you can just buy it. What about uh, yeah, CPU attacks, uh, CPU vulnerabilities? Is, it, is there already kind of a code out there that you can use, like anything ready-made that you can build upon? Oh yes, there are uh, typically researchers uh, publish a proof of concept exploits once they uh, once they crafted uh, uh, an exploit and, and found it because otherwise nobody would really believe it. I can uh, sorry, but I could bullshit 15 pages to get a research paper and uh, without the code where another researcher can really verify it and then uh, oh my god, it it really works. It, it would not be possible and these are, uh, it's, it's common that's, and usual that they are uh, published and once they are published 
of course, they are a bit uh, obfuscated, so that's not uh, these uh, research proof of concepts are limited on, on purpose to avoid large scale exploitation. But of course, uh, skilled attackers can learn from that code and, cr and usually tinker a bit, and then they might find, and then they're pretty sure able to craft very powerful attacks and to unfold the, the entire the entire power of the of these uh, attacks. So if normal attacks would not be uh, so common and so easy, I would definitely expect that there will be a, a black market uh, for, CP for exploiting CPU vulnerabilities as well via JavaScript or whatever. Yeah, I mean, we talked about uh, before, like, is there always a criminal mind behind all the attacks or where do the attacks come from? Because you spoke in your, in your presentation beforehand that also attacks are being carried out by researchers, just researching IT security, trying to get it better. Uh, where do the attacks come from? Is that an is that an option? That it's not only criminal mind behind it? Uh, yes, so, that's that's difficult to say how the where the attacks come from. They come from the very nature that uh, code is executed and that they have that this execution has uh, side effects. So it's like when you walk through a room, you can't really avoid making steps, and these steps they. Uh, make noises and stuff, that's just a side effect. So it's in the very nature of, of code execution to, to have side effects, so they are basically just, just there. Um, what are going to be the... If I might add something, so um, yes, it might be researchers testing out these proof of concepts, but it might also be that some malware authors are testing some similar stuff and they are developing some large scale attack and we don't know about it yet. Yes, yep. that you can never know. That's, that's the most important thing. And this is why security research is important, because we, we never know. As I said before, there, are many st uh, there is usually a way, or often a way, to uh, craft a, a stealth variant of an exploit. So that's uh, then really, really hard to detect. So that's... I think we should not forget that you know, there, is, there is a market out there for vulnerabilities. Yeah, or black market. Flaws, black market. I mean, as an expert, identifying something that is really nice, you could use, you know, remote exploitly, you always have the decision to make, am I, you know, on the good side or on the bad side, because the bad side is paying very well for such stuff. Yes. Um, I had a talk last week with a security expert from Germany. They are doing, you know, export research for, for example, um, mobile phones. So the, the market value for an iPhone exploit and undiscovered so far is about 1.5 million US dollars. So that's solid money. You, know, you, could, you could live from that, of course. So this is, uh, and you know, smaller vulnerabilities or other uh, operating systems or applications pay, I don't know, between 500 and 5,000 dollars. So this is still money you can make uh, and live with. So always you have to do to make the decision white hat or black hat at the end of the day. Or both. And, or <laughs> both, yeah, some do it both, right? Um, so, but, that's where the drive comes from. You know, it's, yeah. here it's also a business at the end of the day. Identifying something uh, that is cool and could be exploited or used on a wide range, it has a market value and you can sell it and live good from it. And you can create an industry. Um, future attacks, uh, you said something very interesting before, Manuel. Uh, you said that a CPU just makes a noise. Yes. It creates acoustics. Yeah. You can actually read the acoustics. Um, yes, how, that's would that, how would that be done? Can you? Go a bit deeper into that. Uh, yeah, you basically just just listen to the uh, to the differences in, in in the noise because electric currency always makes noise, and there are people who can or there are there is a proof of concept implementation for an exploit where you can put two laps up next uh, next to each other and where you can really listen to to uh, uh, to security keys and to encryption keys. And of course, in, in that audience, I mean, that, that would be possible because I'm sitting to, next to you, you're working on your laptop and you're encrypting an email or something at the, this very moment and I could listen to it. Of course, it's, it's a proof of concept, but if, we, if you spend much time on um, further developing the such, such exploits, then you, you might be able to craft something really, uh, really reliable. Could you? Kind of already, or is it already used being right now? Is it already being used right now? Kind of an acoustic exploitation of something? Can you read the data? 
Uh, yes, you can you can read the data. You have to be very close, but I'm um, not aware of uh, of a real world world exploitation. But I'm not aware of everybody with a laptop who's sitting with somebody else with a laptop. So it might be exploited. I don't know. So what is kind of the idea when you're sitting there doing everyday research about IT security? What is kind of what do you expect as a future attack? What what will come uh, onto us? I'll definitely expect more side channel and cover channel attacks, obviously. And as long as we have the, the other facts is, of course, I expect many more uh, classical vulnerabilities like buffer overflows and, and all these uh, or SQL injections or, or whatever, because there is such, so much code out there with, uh, which was designed and written uh, by people who don't know about security or were, who were not aware about security. And where in projects where there were, was no uh, security uh, des uh, design in the in the project design, so I think. But we definitely should uh, be prepared to meet more side channel attacks in the yep. future. Um, Thomas, if you have your clients and you have different projects, um, how much uh, respect do they pay, or how much uh, attention do they pay to the fact of IT security? Is this already defined in the project, or is it just about the functionality of the program? It's usually um, only about the functionality of the program. The clients, um, well, since they're not IT specialists, they're most of the time not aware of um, what kind of attacks and bad things might happen to them. So they mainly fo focus on the, on the functionality. But, um, well, at Catalysts, we, we have a penetration testing team that um, tests each of our products before we give it to the clients. So. Um, and I know they're pretty good at their jobs, so. So what's the success rate? <laughs> I can't say. <laughs> I've, I've never heard of a, an exploit on a Catalyst software, so. Yeah. Um, is your, your company like Radar Services, are you ready for that? Or is it a constant change that you're facing actually in the way that you set up the approach that you have for the IT security system of your clients? Um, is it a constant change? Are you ready for it? Are you ready for future attacks? Well, we hope so. Um, I mean, you have to have um, your researchers on your side also. That's why we have a pen testing team or a uh, red team that does penetration testings with clients and uh, auditing our internal services. Um, uh, at TechWise, if you run cybersecurity monitoring, cyber defense center services for clients and bring the technology with you, you have to continuously adopt. So the easiest thing is all the threat intel that is out there that you have to consider uh, wrap, uh, deduplicate, and use. The other thing is how attacks are going on. So you have to continuously update your use cases, uh, the machine learning components, the technology underneath, and of course the uh, the training of the analysts. Because sometimes it's just important to look for specific, you know, variations of things uh, that could trigger something, and uh, you have to draw the right conclusions as a person there when you sit in front of the data. Uh, so it's it's a continuous battle, to be honest. Of course, um, always defenders and attackers, it's a continuous battle. Uh, the, the, the typical problem out there is that the attack side has more time, infinite time typically. Um, it doesn't matter, most of the cases, they, they don't have to attack now or tomorrow. They can just take the time, the time until they figure out where there is an attack vector they could utilize. And the defenders, the attack organizations, they don't have the time uh, because they have to do everything else to run the stuff. and uh, so they typically cannot focus on the defense side. Uh, and I think that's the advantage of uh, somebody like Radar who really can focus on the defensive side, uh, consider all the technology that is required and has a large base of installations where you can, you can you know, see things on one place and immediately can consider what does that mean for everybody else. So you can continuously update the systems to keep so everybody the, as safe as possible. Is the detection system getting better if you look at like the time it takes to detect an attack? Um, Last year it was about 180 days. Uh, is that getting better? Uh, yes, it's getting better. Yeah, um, it uh, reduces approximately by 50 days per year now, uh, but that will slow down. So it will not be minus 30 days next year. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so uh, this will slow down. Um, why is that? Because there is more technology out there uh, that is being utilized. Uh, there is more awareness out there uh, the, of attacks that are going on. But uh, there is a w very wide span of organizations. So I think with some organizations in some cases that you see out there, it's still 300 days or more until things are um, identified. Uh, and some are much better. You know, just take probably a couple of hours or days 
uh, and every hour you don't get it is really an hour too long, actually, because yeah. really bad things can happen if you don't get it. Are there any questions out there in the auditorium that we would, uh, that would like to, to ask right now? Otherwise, yes, please. Thank you. So, um, in my mind, CPU manufacturers will always um, find it easier to, to sell faster CPUs than secure but less uh, powerful CPUs. Um, are you aware of uh, any CPU manufacturers working on um, any uh, hardware design changes? And if so, maybe you can give us a, a high level. Uh, yes, uh, Intel. Uh, the the next Intel processors, they that they definitely considered uh, Spectre in their design. That's a, there is a, there are white papers and publications about this. So, I uh, I'm, I know it of Intel. I'm pretty sure that AMD, because of market pressure, also works on uh, future on future pro uh, um, mitigations and. A very interesting aspect there is uh, open CPU architectures like like Risk V because all the, the whole design is uh, publicly available and because it's very popular in, in some branches and it's even uh, actively used by Western Digital in their uh, um, hard disk controllers. So uh, I, su I suspect that open hardware designs are are a very good um, approach. Uh, to uh, to f uh, anticipate and to react towards these vulnerabilities because uh, many people and many eyes can look look upon this and help to design uh, resilient hardware designs. I was I was trying to, to steer you more towards sorry <coughs> towards the the hardware side because it, the vulner vulnerabilities you've mentioned. Uh, um, are basically working um, with the, the hyper-threading uh, methods and things like that. So other than the removing them, how, how else can they uh, change the hardware to uh, protect against the, these attacks? Uh, for example, they, they could do a proper, proper permission checks in speculatively executed code. And of course, this means a, a large sl a slowdown in execution speed. But if you if you adapt the design in a way that these uh, these checks can be done in speculatively executed code in a fast way, then this would be a proper defense. And I think this is definitely some uh, an approach that the engineers there will uh, do consider. Sounds great. Thank you. Or can we just pass on the microphone, maybe? Thank you. Um. There was, at the beginning of October, one article at the Bloomberg about uh, China putting small chips on those server main ports. So what is your opinion about it? I've heard dif different, th different things from uh, it's, a, it's a hoax to it's not a hoax to it's uh, just done in a, very, uh, in a very special and very small uh, Number, I so it's it's hard it's hard to tell. What I, what I really can tell is that uh, when you do such exploitations at a very large scale, there is probably uh, really somewhere out there who will detect it, because getting the data is when you adapt, when you have access to the hardware design that's that's pretty easy, but getting the, the data out there from from the system is is hard because uh, professional companies and uh, and agencies who use that hardware they of course they monitor that their traffic of course you can then craft some ways to to uh, hide that data by let's say you uh, at when you have a when you have a long time uh, you access a YouTube video and say that's one bit and the day later you access another YouTube video during uh, and this would also be a way for a for a covered channel. So there is uh, just as example, there is always a way to to get the data out. But it's it's really hard to it's really hard to say. Uh, yeah, yeah. Does it answer your question? Because I, I I was I was not there. I have not I had access or did not analyze the the hardware design. So it's really I. Hard to give a real serious um, expertise on that. 
some, something deep, deeper in, in yes. knowledge about it. So they, nobody so published like something deeper, so... Pointing the finger and, and saying this is... Yeah, it could, could be a political attempt as well. I, I, I don't know. Yeah, before the midterm elections. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it's possible. It's, but it's, on the other hand, it's technically possible to encode data like in hiding it and it calls to YouTube videos as well. But on the other hand, when you do it on a large scale, uh, it, it uh, will somebody will notice it due to traffic monitoring. So it's it's really hard, and you you can't really say because there is just this one Bloomberg article and a lot of speculation and few rumors out there. Thank you. Um, but since we know that the Chinese are really big on surveillance, because uh, as you might know, they are working on implementing a social score. Um, and they will give everyone like r ratings and uh, people with, with good ratings will ha have access to better services and people with less good ratings will be kicked out of society so yeah um, social credit is already in place yes um, in some if cities. you are too low with social credits in China you're not uh, allowed to board a plane anymore yes <laughs> we so, do have another question can this be a marketing strategy? You know, the adoption of Windows 10 was very hard. Um, and uh, we are using old, uh, old hardware. Uh, can be this uh, marketing strategy from companies? You said about uh, uh, escalation of uh, number of uh, attacks, number of vulnerabilities from uh, 2016. And this can be, I think, a way to, to buy new hardware, new software, to adopt new technologies, software technologies, to invest more money. Can be? Right, yeah, of course. I mean, there, there's, there have always been rumors that uh, the antivirus companies were the first guys to write viruses. Um, so it can drive the market uh, in, in some respect, I think. Um, I think it's it's a balance. Uh, the, the 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 criminal mot motivation behind the tax. So the, typically, it's money, of course, nowadays, or nation states. Nation states are money, both basically. Um, and the, 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 it's a big market, uh, as you know, and uh, it's going to get even bigger out there. So th that drives, I think, some motivations for investments uh, out there. Um, but at the end of the day, you never can say that, uh, that I don't know, a previous server firewall or something uh, is not the other guy who's doing at the attacks at the same time. It could be, always. If I remember well, Heartbleed was known by NSA two years in advance, no? And I, I would say I was least, thinking, least, yeah. Spectre, how long did, he, did they know about this, uh, this vulnerability? Well, that, that's what I tried to say before on a very, you know, <laughs> careful way. Uh, that there is always, a, you know, some parties out there might have a very, very long-term strategy to achieve things. They have the time, they have the money, they have the, the, the companies there on site. So th this is kind of strange, to be honest, the things that are going on here. And unfortunately, uh, we Europeans, we have left, uh, we have given up everything or the core technology we had here, uh, the, the knowledge and everything regarding IT, which has given away over the last 30 years. And when you take a closer look at the cybersecurity industry, it's pretty much the same because we have, I don't know, 10, 15 cybersecurity, solid cybersecurity companies in Europe anymore. And the rest is America or it's Israel or it's China nowadays. Um, this is frightening. This is really frightening because everything is IT and everything will be IT in future. So and if we don't have the technology to, you know, to keep that under control or to monitor it or to detect things, then we are, it's going to be a dark, dark times in future if we don't take care here. Uh, regarding the attacks, uh, things and servers, there, there, there is a documented case of, of the NSA, uh, you know, optimizing Cisco routers before going out to clients. So that was done in the past, and that I'm sure that's given business nowadays for, for some agencies doing this on a larger scale. This was actually, thanks very much for the question, because it was uh, where I wanted to get uh, for the last uh, round uh, that we're discussing right now. Is it a business model, what we're doing here? And you said something before in your presentation, actually in cloud computing, um, those attacks are not as present as they are on local systems. Um, could it be the ones, the providers of cloud computing services, could it be them uh, trying to show that cloud computing is safer, something you should change to? Uh, no, uh, 
de de definitely not. I mean, uh, you definitely you can um, also access um, attack cloud comp uh, computing infrastructure. And I mean, the trivial case is that you just rent a virtual server on on some uh, on some cloud, and then you know many other virtual machines run on the same physical host. So there is definitely an, an attack vector. I just said or meant that it's uh, typically more. Uh, more challenging to to attack there because the the timing behavior or the, the timing factor is uh, which all these side channels build upon is very hard to predict because you can't really know what the other systems are doing but um, i think it's uh, definitely necessary that cloud computing providers uh, must take these challenges very seriously and this threat very seriously all right thank you uh, last round of questions, if anyone has a question. So about isolated, isolated uh, platforms, like, uh, whatever, doesn't mind. Um, like you said, it's very easy to make a malware that escapes the virtual machine and attacks the physical machine. Mm -hmm. So in this case, even if the physical platform is uh, offline, mm -hmm. isolated from uh, the internet, the fact that uh, the virtual machines can be attacked is not it's not safe either way right uh, yes i agree but i i don't really understand how a cloud infrastructure can be offline you need to uh, customers uh, or attackers must uh, must uh, install their software somehow and of course it can be malicious then as well and when you install the software or even if you if you ship cds or dvds to them it could be uh, there, there can be some some software exploiting these but then there is no uh, vector to get the data out when there is when they are not online yeah but the physical part is online just the ah okay the, sorry the virtual part is is uh, online the physical part is offline the hey, physical you, servers you cannot really separate the both that much I mean, uh, the physical part has to be online for the virtual part to be online. All right. Yeah, at the, at the technical level, yes. Wonderful. Any other question that we have? Okay, so uh, the gentleman there uh, stole, <laughs> read my mind, they stole the question about the super micro main boards. Um, somehow related to this, um, given that we rely on uh, external or foreign uh, hardware and uh, the current trends uh, like uh, governments uh, uh, asking for uh, cryptographic expert to break encryption just so they will have a backdoor, how much uh, should we be concerned about uh, intentionally introduced uh, vulnerabilities because any backdoor you with a vulnerability will be discovered uh, by third parties eventually well i would say uh, you should always be concerned about uh, the hardware you are using as i said in my presentation we we cannot even trust the memory and even even though I, I personally, I wouldn't distinguish between vulnerabilities that were placed there uh, on purpose, with a real malicious purpose, or by vulnerabilities that are there uh, mistakenly, or because it's any vulnerability is a potential attack vector. So I would definitely be uh, aware of both. Yeah, but uh, do you think uh, this could make things uh, much worse? I would they, be very worried. From the start. Yes, I would be very worried uh, as well because uh, the number of vulnerabilities that are disclosed is increasing. So this is this just speaks for itself. We we need to be more more aware, definitely, and things will get worse. All right, thank you very much uh, for the question. Thanks very much for the answer. If we go into a last statement from everybody, I just might pick up uh, a presentation of yours, Harald, where you said on the first page, don't panic, plan. So what's the future, uh, what's the future ahead of us in terms of IT security? Yeah, don't panic, I think it's uh, doable. Um, I think the, 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 the key word is uh, resilience, really thinking about what can we do in a, in a wider portfolio, 
uh, to prepare ourselves for, for these dark times I was mentioning before. And it's not getting better, full stop. It's not getting better. So we have to prepare ourselves and do everything we can regarding design, people, training, education, uh, monitoring, awareness, awareness, yeah, really, really taking care of everything. So th th don't, don't trust technology, again, full stop. The technology will not solve your problem here. And don't trust the memory. <laughs> <laughs> so basically it's, um, resilience mean be prepared for things that are here and be open-eyed, go around and not, not try to blind out things. Yeah. Thank you, Harald. Tamas. And be open-minded about future things that, I mean, future discoveries uh, and scenarios that you didn't anticipate because you never know. Like these Project Zero guys, they just had this crazy idea and, well, nobody anticipated it. Manuel? Uh, yeah. Uh, I just continue what Thomas said. Nobody anticipated these exploits and I think the, this is because of the very nature, because uh, attacks by now have become that complex that they really exploit the, the designs uh, that, were, that were made and the, the attack vectors are so complex and so in, in incredible complex that an engineer who is just uh, designing it with the mind to, to get it working with, even though with security in mind, cannot, uh, even if it's a team, they cannot uh, face any uh, challenge, any security challenge they have, if it's at that complex level. All right, thank and you that's very much. Creative. So, Sorry? Don't panic. And, uh, and that's creative. It, yeah. it, it requires a certain amount of um, Time. Art, artistry to be able to come up with these things. Yeah, absolutely. And so you need many teams and one single team cannot see everything because you, every, everybody is different. Huh? That's right. Yeah. yeah. Wonderful. Thank you very much. I guess we're closing it off like this. Thanks very much to Harald Reisinger from Radar Services. Thanks very much to Tamas Bakos from Catalysts and Manuel Wiesinger from SP Research. Thank you very much. I guess don't panic, but don't trust your memory. Yeah, that's the spirit. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.